Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you very much for joining us from wherever you're joining us. We hope you're keeping safe during this uh, COVID period. <clears throat> Today we are having the most anticipated webinar thus far, which is on the act of drafting arbitration clauses. Now this webinar is being hosted by the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. Those not familiar <clears throat> with the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, the center is one of the leading international dispute resolution institutions, <clears throat> which in the recent past has taken a very key role in the development and evolution of the understanding and practice of arbitration. Back to our theme, which is the art of drafting arbitration clauses. I believe all of us are aware of what art is. And today we want to picture that masterpiece of an arbitration clause that will be effective um, and that will enable you as practitioners be able to enforce your arbitration agreements and have a uh, fast expeditious, both in terms of cost and uh, the time arbitration process. So we'll be joined by a leading panel of international ideas um, today, who will enable us paint that masterpiece of an arbitration clause that is desired. And allow me to introduce them briefly. And I will start with Jerry Kariuki, because you know their introduction is really part of the content. That is, if you get to know what their profiles are. Jerry is a chartered arbitrator. She's also a certified mediator. In Kenya, in terms of arbitration, we are actually going to place her almost at the level of a national treasure in terms of arbitration. She has a long and checkered career in international arbitration and mediation, and is also an advocate of the High Court. Now, Jerry has been recognized since 2014 by, among others, uh, chambers and partners. And in Kenya, one of the things that we are going to, to mention about her is the fact that in the recent past, she has been part of a team uh, leading a dispute resolution board in the energy sector. Other than her practice, she has also been involved in the teaching of arbitration and teachers and tutors uh, both domestically in Kenya and internationally with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Welcome, Jerry. If you can hear me, you can just raise your hand or nod. Thank you so much. Next, I will introduce Mr. Thomas Snyder. Thomas is a partner and head of arbitration in the firm of Alta Mini and Company Advocates, which is situated in the United Arab Emirates. Tom has been involved in international arbitration and sits in the International Arbitration Court of Singapore. Outside of that is also in the panel of several global international arbitration institutions. And we are actually very um, grateful to have him here in Kenya because one of his highlights in terms of his career is the fact that he was a counsel in the dispute between Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea. Uh, and that dispute was uh, for about nine years. And he was in Ethiopia as a counsel in that matter. Outside of his practice uh, of international arbitration, where he represents states and parties in among others, investment disputes, states to state disputes, he's also lectured at the George Washington University in uh, Washington, D.C. Welcome, Thomas. 
Thank you. Finally, allow me to introduce Mr. Kagwa. Kagwa is an advocate and leading litigant and arbitrator practicing in Uganda. And his firm is Kagwa and Kagwa Advocates. The firm focuses on arbitration, commercial litigation, and construction law. Kagwa has a wide experience in the leading recognized international arbitration rules, including the London Court of Arbitration rules, the ancestral uh, arbitration rules, which is the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law rules. I believe now he's also familiar with Nairobi Center for International Arbitration Rules. Outside of that, he's familiar with and a member of the Ugandan uh, Center for Dispute Resolution, CADA. And he is known as that arbitrator whose award has never been set aside. So that shows a little bit about the nature of a practitioner that he is, other than showing us that probably the Ugandan courts are supportive of arbitration. I think it shows us who he actually is. Uh, we want to thank him for being here today and welcome him to the session. Now, we have a live chat and you're invited as uh, participants to ask questions, which we will ensure are brought to the attention of the panelists who will answer all the questions that you're asking. We already have one question to the panelists. And this question is this, why do we need three panelists to speak on a matter such as an arbitration clause? Okay, and I trust that this question will be answered as we go through the session. Now, I will pose questions to the panelists, and the panelists will be able to answer the questions. Importantly, we'll be focusing on what constitutes an effective arbitration clause, what are the common pitfalls, and how you can secure the best possible clause. My first question would be posed to Thomas. You may need to... Thank you. Why would someone choose arbitration and consequently have a provision of international arbitration in their international arbitration um, contract? Why arbitration? Thank you, uh, Eunice, and uh, uh, good day to everyone. It, it, it's, it's good to see so many participants taking part in this. I see a lot of familiar faces uh, or familiar names among the attendees, so it, it's, it's good to be here. Uh, and let me say thank you to the uh, NCIA for uh, inviting me to take part. I, I have to say that the last time I traveled outside of Dubai, uh, was back in March when I attended the NCIA conference in Mombasa, um, which was a, an excellent conference, great speakers, uh, uh, and a great turnout. Um, so I'm really longing to, to return to Kenya, um, but for the time being, I think uh, uh, doing this virtually is the next best thing. Uh, hopefully we'll be uh, uh, meeting each other in person again uh, very soon. Um, so with that, introduction, let me turn to the question that Eunice posed to me, and that is, why arbitration? Why do parties use arbitration to solve, to resolve their international commercial disputes? Um, I think there are several reasons for this. Um, there's probably a laundry list of seven, eight, nine, ten reasons you could put together if you were really trying. Um, in my mind, there are two main reasons, maybe a third main reason as well. Um, probably the most important reason why parties choose international arbitration to resolve their disputes is the New York Convention, the Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, which has now been around for uh, six decades. It's been ratified by virtually every country on the planet. I think Ethiopia's recent ratification made it the 165th 
uh, state party to the New York Convention. And what the New York Convention does is make, uh, I'm boiling this down a little bit, but it's, it makes arbitral awards more easily enforceable. And especially when you're in a situation where you have parties from jurisdiction, where you may have assets that you want to enforce again in, in different jurisdictions, having an arbitral award makes it much easier to do that because of the New York Convention. There's no similar convention for court judgments. And so arbitral awards are much more portable in terms of enforceability. I think in my view, the second main reason why parties like to use international arbitration as opposed to other forms of dispute resolution is what I call the neutrality factor. Um, if, you are, if you are a Kenyan party in a dispute with a party from the UAE, um, the Kenyan party may not want to come to the courts in the UAE. They're not familiar with the procedures There may be language issues There may be other concerns and vice versa. The UAE party won't be familiar, familiar with the, uh, the Kenyan courts. Um, and so arbitration is an alternative way to resolve this dispute in a more neutral form, a form that parties feel comfortable with. I think the third main reason in my book is sort of the flexibility that international arbitration offers in terms of the procedures. Now, as many of us know that practice international arbitration, I, I think for the most part, there, there is a fairly typical procedure that you follow in most arbitrations, but the parties are free to fashion their arbitration in different ways. They can do pleading style, they can do memorial style, they can dispense with uh, hearings if they choose to do so, they can have hearings online, uh, so on and so forth. There are other factors as well, and, and for, in the interest of time, I won't spend too much time on this. I, I think two factors that often come into play are um, cost savings and speed or efficiency of the proceedings. My own view is that when you're talking about international arbitration, international arbitration, often those factors aren't as compelling uh, because international arbitration proceedings often do take a long time and they can be expensive. I think in the domestic arbitration context, those factors are probably uh, important as well. The last thing I would say on this very briefly is that if you, if you look at some of the surveys that have been done, the Queen Mary survey in 2018, for example, an overwhelming 97% of the uh, 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 participants in that survey said that international arbitration, either standing alone or in combination with mediation or conciliation uh, is their preferred method of resolving cross-border disputes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, what is an arbitration agreement? What is an arbitration agreement? It's a very basic question, a very important question. Um, uh, an arbitration agreement is exactly what its name implies. It's an agreement between two parties to resolve their dispute through arbitration. Now, an arbitration agreement has very important legal ramifications. If parties enter into an arbitration agreement, they are thereby giving up their rights to resolve their disputes in the national courts. And sort of an attendant uh, obligation to an arbitration agreement is the obligation on the courts to recognize that the parties have done that and to refer them to arbitration if the matter comes before the court. Now, when we hear the phrase arbitration agreement, it might connote uh, images of, you know, a four or five page standalone agreement. You can have that when you're talking about arbitration agreements, but typically uh, in practice, an arbitration agreement really is merely a clause uh, contained in a broader substantive contract uh, in which the parties agree to resolve disputes under that contract through arbitration. Cool, thank you. Now, I've seen a number of uh, questions coming in, which we have taken note of, and I see from the list we have participants, some of whom are in-house counsel, and counsel representing parties in arbitration. What would you tell them would be the key considerations when they are negotiating and drafting arbitration agreements? For example, what would you say um, are the very key aspects? 
That's what we're going to talk about for the next hour and a half, really. <laughs> um, but, but I would say sort of two things at a high level. Um, number one, keep it simple. Um, and, and it, you know, I, I think this is one of my key takeaways. Um, drafting an arbitration agreement is a simple process. Your starting point should be the model arbitration clause that's offered by an arbitral institution. You don't need a four or five page agreement. Um, uh, but you'd be surprised at how often parties get it wrong. Um, I think later in, in today's presentation, we're going to look at some so-called pathological uh, arbitration clauses. But, but I think at the end of the day, what you need is a reference to binding arbitration. You need to um, uh, uh, identify the seat of the arbitration uh, with some caveats. You need to identify the number of arbitrators. Um, uh, and, and a few other key points that, that, that I think my uh, uh, colleagues and I will, will talk about. You know, uh, historically, um, arbitration agreements were referred to as midnight clauses. And the reason they were called midnight clauses is, is, is the idea is that, you know, the parties would start negotiating the, the contract at 9 a.m., uh, spend the day doing that, sort out all the aspects of the contract, and then almost as an afterthought, it, at the end of the day at midnight, when they're exhausted and tired, they'd just throw in an arbitration agreement without really thinking about it. They shouldn't be midnight clauses. They should be nine or 10 a.m. clauses. They should be one of the first things the parties think about. Again, it, it, keep it simple, keep it short, but think about these key factors that my fellow panelists and I will be delving into. Thomas. Is it important for someone to consider whether or not to, 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 take, to have in their clause um, ad hoc arbitration or institutional arbitration? Is it important? And if so, why? Yeah, I, I think it's fundamentally important. Um, um, you know, generally speaking, your two options are, as you've just said, ad hoc arbitration, where much of the procedure is left to the parties. Um, and the other alternative is to use an arbitral institution, such as the NCIA, to administer your dispute for the parties. My strong preference, this is my personal view, is that 99 times out of 100, parties should opt for institutional arbitration because institutional arbitration um, will resolve many of the typical pitfalls and problems that parties run into in their arbitration. Um, the arbitral institution will have a comprehensive set of procedural rules that will address most of the issues that the parties may encounter. I mentioned a moment ago that one of the key elements you should consider including in your arbitration clause is the seat of the arbitration, the legal place of the arbitration. The beauty of using arbitral institutions to administer your dispute is that if the parties forget to identify the seat of the arbitration or don't do so for whatever reason, most arbitral institutions, the rules of most arbitral institutions will have a default seat. So you'll have some uh, certainty in that regard. For, for example, the NCIA's default seat is, as you would expect, uh, Nairobi. Um, the rules will address other issues as well. In theory, ad hoc arbitration gives parties more flexibility, but it also creates more opportunities for mischief. Um, in practice, if parties opt for ad hoc arbitration, they'll often adopt the UNCTRAL model rules as the procedural rules. But, but a key difference in my mind is, let's say, for example, in ad hoc arbitration, the parties can't agree on who the arbitrators are going to be. Well, then if they can't agree, then you're going to end up in court because the supervisory court will have to appoint the arbitrator on behalf of the parties. And if, if, if you're trying to stay out of court by selecting arbitration, in my view, that sort of defeats the purpose. Whereas if you're an in institutional arbitration, that's going to be addressed by the rules in the center itself. Thank you. I heard you mention the seat of arbitration. Could you explain the significance of the seat of arbitration to the participants? Sure. So, so the seat of the arbitration is also fundamentally important. And I would say for two main reasons. Um, number one, the seat or the legal place of the arbitration um, identifies which national law, which national uh, procedural law will regulate the arbitration. 
And so if, if the arbitration is seated in uh, Nairobi, the Kenyan arbitra arbitration law will govern the proceedings. If the seat is here in Dubai, then the UAE federal arbitration law will govern the proceedings. So it's very important in that regard. I, I think the other key importance of the seat is it also identifies which courts will have supervisory jurisdiction over the arbitration. And that's, uh, as I was alluding to a moment ago, that's particularly important in the context of ad hoc arbitration. Uh, if there's certain procedural issues that can't be resolved between the parties, then uh, they have to go to the supervisory court and the supervisory court is determined by the, the seat or place of, of arbitration. All right. Perhaps you can hear from Jerry Kariuki. Do you agree that we should strongly opt for institutional arbitration or what views do you have on the decision to make when parties are negotiating the arbitration uh, contract? Uh, my view is that uh, it depends on the type of arbitration. I, I, I do agree with uh, Thomas that where it's an international arbitration concerned, institutional arbitrations are the very best. However, because we have very many in-house lawyers, I would like them to understand that you have to be discerning when it comes to drafting your clause, because you have to keep in mind that uh, domestic parties don't need institutional arbitrations, or at least they shouldn't need them um, at the same level as international. I'm not saying that ad hoc are the best, because as Thomas says, you could well end up in court unless you have a, a third party or a default appointer, like maybe NCIA or Chartered Institute or something or the other. In the, in the event that the parties fail to see eye to eye on, their, on, on appointing a, a, an arbitrator. So for in-house, please, when you're drafting, be careful. Is it international? Is it domestic? Are these parties, because what I find is that uh, for, for institutional arbitrations like ICC and some other institutions, it's quite expensive to make use of these uh, institutional institutions. So always keep in mind your, the party's pockets uh, and as to whether they are going to be able to afford on an international level um, an institutional arbitration. I have one clause, which as it must have been a midnight clause as Thomas uh, describes, because this was a poor farmer in Kitale. <laughs> and, and okay, an international, an NGO. And uh, the, the person who was drafting this agreement said that all disputes on and so forth have to be uh, adjudicated over by, uh, in the, the, I, I think it was ICC. And I said, oh my goodness, this poor person is never going to be able to pursue this thing, you see? So when you're drafting, don't, don't say, as, don't keep it at midnight, put it at nine o'clock to 10 o'clock and consider everything before you as to whether your clause is appropriate for the dispute. I think that's what you need to do. And then just to also support uh, Thomas, Keep your claws short, sharp, and sweet, okay? Don't make it too complicated because once you do that, then there'll be problems. Um, I think it, it, your claws should be final. The, um, it should have, be of a binding nature. It should mention the seat, the con uh, compilation of the tribunal, and perhaps the substantive law, if that is not in the contract, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps just on that, maybe we can address two questions that have arisen. The first is, if parties have chosen ad hoc arbitration, can they opt for institutional arbitration afterwards and how do they go about it? Do you want to start with that, Jerry? Thank you, Eunice. Yes. Uh, yes, you know, it depends. At what level of uh, are, are the parties when the, once the, the, the dispute has, uh, has, uh, has arisen? 
You know, when everything is hunky-dory, people really agree very quickly. But once that dispute has arisen, are the parties able to reach some consensus? Having agreed to do it ad hoc, can they switch to institutional, all right, and vice versa? Are you able to come to some form of agreement at that point in time once the dispute has arisen? I think that's what you need to consider, yeah. Because you see, arbitration, remember, is very consensual. In, in any event, that is what should at all times be encouraged, even once the arbitrator is, 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 is appointed. So can the parties agree? If they're able to, then why not? If they're not able to, then you stick to what you agreed with in, uh, in right at the outset. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thomas, maybe you can address this question. How do, do you designate a seat of arbitration when the contract is silent on the seat? Okay, so if the contract is silent on the seat, uh, I, I see two possibilities. One is that here again, the parties can always agree to the seat once the dispute or the arbitration has uh, commenced. Now, as in Jerry said, um, often once a dispute has commenced, the parties can't agree on anything. Um, but certainly uh, if they're able to do so, uh, uh, they can do so. Um, in the absence of party agreement, then um, again, um, if you're in institutional arbitration, most um, institutional rules will have a default seat of arbitration. And if they don't, then it will be up to the, uh, typically will be up to the arbitrator to decide. Um, you know, my own view is that parties should um, nine times out of 10 agree um, on the seat um, when they, enter into the arbitration agreement um, initially. I, I, I think, you know, taking a step back, I think what you want to try to achieve, um, and, and I think this is particularly important for in-house counsel, what you want to achieve when you enter into an arbitration agreement is as much certainty as you can, so that you know once a dispute arises, what institution you're going to use to administer the arbitration, um, what the applicable national arbitration law is going to be, what the seat's going to be, and try to resolve these issues early on. Okay, moving on. Uh, Jerry, back to you. Is the seat the same as venue in arbitration? Uh, that is one of uh, the biggest problems for the people I have trained. Um, seat does not equal venue. But we will ask it in, during our training sessions, we will start, this is, we will deal with this kind of uh, question from the outset. But when we get to another level, people are still confused. So no, no, no. Seat does not equate to venue. Venue is where you're going to hold the arbitration, okay? The seat is the procedural law of that reference. So if you designate the seat as Nairobi, the Arbitration Act of uh, 1995 as amended in 2010 will apply. But I could easily go to Uganda. We can say that, no, uh, we will hold the arbitration in Kampala. Oh, OK. So there's, the, 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 the procedural law does not change just because you've moved to a, a different venue. You could even have the seat as UK and have the venue here in Nairobi. Thank you. But, but the seat remains, the procedural law remains of the UK. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you. In terms of international arbitration, what is the significance of language? That's mine. Particularly from different Yes, it is yours. That's mine. Language uh, is mainly applicable, as you've noted, within the international arbitration sphere. 
um, not particularly important in domestic arbitrations. This comes into play when the parties are from different jurisdictions, okay? And you have to choose a neutral language, okay? And um, also dependent also on the seat. Like if there's a French and a Spanish um, arbitration, which is the most important language? Can you agree on a language for both of them? Are there more French speakers or more Spanish? And does it go also to the seat? So in domestic arbitrations, as you draft a clause, please don't bother with language. It's, it's re actually irrelevant to be assumed because it's domestic, the language, the prevailing language within that jurisdiction is what will be used. So it's only if you're drafting an, a, 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 an international arbitration clause that you'll have to consider language. Is it English? Is it French? Is it Spanish? Is it Portuguese? Depending on the nationality of the parties. Thank you, Njeri. You mentioned the procedural law. Now here we are looking at the art of drafting a proper effective arbitration clause. Could there be a law that is specifically applicable to that arbitration clause and a law that is also applicable to the contract itself what are the different types of laws that can be applicable at any one time to an arbitration? I would say uh, at least, at the very minimum, there are two. One is the procedural law, which is reflected in the choice of your seat. And the second one is the substantive law, which is the substantive law of the contract that has been drawn or on which, from which the dispute arises. So you have to be careful to differentiate the two, the two. The contract could well at the end indicate a subject or the, the laws of Kenya apply. Then the seat could be Uganda or Kampala. So procedural law versus substantive law, please ensure to have these two understand that these two are not the same, they do not mean the same thing. Um, and, and, and please don't confuse them. Yes, Thomas. So if I, I was just going to jump in here, uh, if I may, um, to muddy the waters a little bit, because yes. arguably there's even a, a third law that could apply, although it's typically one of the two that, and Jerry just mentioned, but that is what law governs the arbitration agreement itself? and this might come into play when there are issues about the scope of the arbitration agreement or the validity of the arbitration agreement. And there's different views on this. In some jurisdictions, uh, the prevailing law is that the law of the seat of the arbitration also governs the arbitration agreement itself, whereas other jurisdictions might say, no, it's the substantive law of the contract in which uh, the arbitration agreement is contained. Uh, or it might even depend on the circumstances. Uh, so that, that's kind of a, I would say, a, a muddy area uh, of the law. I think there was a recent UK court judgment on this very issue. Um, but I, what you're seeing as a result of this, I think more and more um, uh, institutional rules are clarifying which law applies to the arbitration agreement itself. Thank you. David, do you want to say something about this? <laughs> no, it has been completely covered by Jerry and Thomas. Okay. <clears throat> In terms of selecting, when you're drafting the contract, when you're selecting the appropriate um, tribunal, do you have, do you go for one arbitrator or two arbitrators or three or five or seven or four? What are some of the considerations to include uh, when you're drafting this specific uh, clause? Jerry, if we are to just finish with you. Um, now, I think one of the most important considerations that must be taken into account is cost, okay? Why do you need three, tri uh, three tribunal members 
or a tribunal of three when one will do. Okay. I have seen also clauses which just jump right on to appointing um, three tribunal members when the um, value of the contract really does not support it. I have seen others where there are two arbitrators. I don't know if <laughs> it's not pathological, but uh, that can bring problems unless you're trying to draw on the skills of each uh, tribunal member, but it is either one or three. That's the best thing. But does the transactional value support the appointment of three uh, members of this tribunal? Mainly, and I'll uh, say, I think in domestic, mainly three less. Again, I, I repeat, the transactional value of the contract supports the appointment of three and that it is a complex contract. If it is a simple one, then surely one will do. Arbitration can become expensive, okay? And when you have three and what you want are three eminent arbitrators and your, the, your, the transactional value of your contract is not even 10 million shillings. Really, do you think there'll be anything left for the, the winner? Or whoever takes, you know, in whom, whose favor the ultimate award will be. That, that's what you have to keep in mind. And I think, honestly, to be fair to parties, stick to one on domestic level unless the transactional value so demands. On international tribunals, again, I think the transactional value does come into play. Because even in international arbitration, we do try to keep costs down, okay? So those are the things that you must keep in mind and not just say, wow, I've got this tribunal, this clause that I'm preparing. I think three will do. When you, you realize you're going to pauperize the parties. Thank you. Thank you. David, if you don't mind, yep. what are some of the considerations in international arbitration that one must really carefully consider in terms of uh, the expertise of the tribunal? Um, is diversity an issue? Um, the nationality? Could you maybe just comment on that in terms of drafting of uh, and, and choosing the, the type of tribunal? Uh, it, it, thank you. It all depends. It all depends. There are certain agreements that involve complex infrastructure projects where you may need an expert, for example, in oil and gas to sit on the tribunal, uh, or if there are multi-contracts where certain contracts involve uh, experts in construction or experts in energy, from the onset, uh, just like Thomas said, uh, it should be an early morning close, nine to 10, for the parties to agree that the complexity of this contract would require an expert in say oil and gas uh, or energy. And then you include that in the arbitration clause from the onset uh, that uh, the person who is going to decide or sit on the tribunal uh, should have a particular qualification. So it all depends on the nature of the substantive contract. Are there things that should be avoided? I don't know if you have come across some difficulty. I remember there was a time where perhaps you can give some tips that uh, council can avoid. I remember there's a, a contract once that uh, uh, parties had specified they need uh, three arbitrators of qualified in the skill of artificial insemination and such things you really they may end up dragging and dra dragging a, an arbitration from taking off simply because parties are trying to locate that specific skill in a in a certain jurisdiction have you come across any of that thomas yes and and, and my advice is 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 to try to avoid doing that my, my advice is at the outset when you're drafting the arbitration agreement not to impose too many qualifications on who your arbitrators will be uh, because you never know 
what the actual dispute that arises is going to be. Um, you, you may be in a position when, when you're drafting the arbitration, uh, arbitration agreement to say, look, this is a construction matter. We'll likely need an engineer or something like that. So let's impose a qualification that the arbitrator needs to be a, an engineer. And then you get into the contract and the dispute is actually more of a legal dispute, not a technical dispute at all. So I generally, um, my approach is to keep your options open, not to impose any, if many, if any, uh, qualifications on who your arbitrator is going to be. You want to have as much uh, flexibility as you can once the dispute has arisen and you can assess the particular circumstances. And the other thing is you know, might impose uh, qualifications and as you alluded to a moment ago, you might not be able to find anybody that meets those uh, or spend too much time doing it then the arbitration drags on. Thank you. Jerry, any final thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I, I recalled a, a conversation I once had with uh, uh, some colleagues, some Nigerian colleagues where they were most insistent that it would be the, the best idea would be to um, insert the name of a specific person as an arbitrator. And I asked myself, and what if between the time you draft this document and the time that the dispute arises, this person dies? And uh, you have no default <laughs> appointing authority. What, what happens? So just, just like Thomas, I say, I think keep your options open and keep it simple as also. Um, because you, you may look for somebody with the millions of qualifications. Of course, when you're drafting, it's all looking very lovely and flowery and so on and so forth. And you're feeling wonderful. You've been asked to draw this, uh, this clause, but be careful because you, the drafter, will leave the ones having to sort out that dispute with problems. So keep it simple, please. And don't, you don't insert anybody's, any a specific individual's name into a contract. Okay. Thank you. Now, what would be the drafting advice to ensure that a dispute is not, uh, you know, is found to be um, defective? Uh, so to speak, because it does not fall within the scope um, of, of the contract of the, of the dispute resolution clause. What would be the drafting advice? What should you include to ensure that the dispute is covered by the tribunal? Jerry, any thoughts before you leave? I, I think we mentioned quite a few things that you need to cover earlier. Uh, finality of the, of the clause to ensure that it covers all disputes, the seat, the tribunal, the substantive law, binding nature. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think scope, you say if and any, I mean all and any, because what's important is that you cover all the disputes that these parties may have arising from that contract. And that's why I think uh, Thomas and I have said, keep it, keep it short, keep it simple, but make sure you cover any and all disputes. I know in the past there has been uh, quite a few authorities um, discussing whether or not any is uh, uh, covers the disputes in in um, in question, but it does so. All and any, both of those words okay. cover the disputes, so that the scope of the agreement is covered, and any disputes arising therefrom. Yeah. Okay. There are several questions arising on this issue, and we'll get back to them uh, in a short while. David. You have been silent for um, a long while. Would you briefly explain about multi-party and multi-contract arbitrations? Uh, briefly, uh, 
most of the transactions these days um, involving mergers and acquisitions or infrastructure projects um, involve situations where there are multi parties. Uh, for example, if it's a, uh, an infrastructure project, there may be uh, a financier on one hand, um, a client on the other, maybe a government, and there may be a developer on the other hand who's going to develop the infrastructure project. And then there may be a subcontractor who is getting um, the works from the main contractor. And you realize that each of those parties will be governed by a separate contract of which each of those parties will have an arbitration clause included. So it's very important to make sure that in multi-contract situations, um, the arbitration agreements are consistent with one another. You don't want one which has a seat in Singapore, another one is seat in London, another one is seat in Kampala, another one is seat in Kenya, uh, because there may be a situation where uh, there is a need for joinder of the parties or uh, for it, disputes to be resolved uh, in one place. So it's important to have consistency to that extent. And as far as, uh, so that will cover the multi-contracts and then it will also cover uh, the multi-parties. So those are the situations in brief. Okay. What about contracts that are normally multi-tiered? How do you draft an effective multi-tiered dispute resolution clause? Could you explain to the participants what we mean by multi-tiered dispute resolution clauses, and what should they look out for when drafting those? Um, the multi-tier dispute resolution clause uh, is basically a clause where the parties agree to exhaust alternative dispute resolution mechanisms uh, before they go to um, either arbitration or litigation. Um, but basically, it's where the parties agree that uh, in the event of a dispute, uh, the directors of the respective companies will have to meet and discuss in good faith to see if they can resolve the dispute, uh, fairly of which uh, the matter can be sent to a mediator who will be a neutral party to assist the parties uh, resolve the dispute, fairly of which uh, the parties will refer the matter to arbitration um, for final resolution. So um, in essence, that's the multi-tier. Uh, the essence of it is that there must be timelines for each step. Otherwise, it, it can be subject to abuse. So you're better off saying, in case of a dispute, within the first, say, 15 days, uh, the directors must meet. The mediation, you say, as soon as the mediator has been appointed, uh, the mediation must be concluded within 30 days, uh, fairly of which then arbitration will commence. And of course, arbitration has its own timelines under the statute or under the contract. Some statutes, it's 60 days. That is very useful, and I think we see a lot of those in construction disputes. Um, what would you have to say about accelerated procedures? Because of late, we have been seeing um, a number of uh, institutions adopting accelerated procedures. Is it important to include it in your agreement? What is the significance? Accelerated procedure to begin with is where the parties agree that once a dispute arises, it should be resolved um, in a limited period of time. Accelerated in the sense that the parties agree to dispense with certain procedural requirements which are non fundamental. For example, uh, the parties may agree that um, once a dispute arises and an arbitrator has been appointed, um, the notice of arbitration can go with a statement of claim, it reduces the time. And then once the respondent is responding, the response can be followed with a response to the statement of claim. And the parties can agree that um, the dispute will be resolved uh, best on the documents that have been submitted. Therefore, the parties dispense with a full trial. There will not be need for cross-examination and re-examination, and there will be no need um, of uh, bringing witnesses and flying them all over the place. It is most appropriate that is the accelerated approach in situations where the, the money in dispute is low, um, such that it's not really worth it to spend a lot of time and money to resolve it. And it's also common in certain uh, institutional clauses, which provide that below a certain threshold, um, ICC, for example, initially used to say, where a claim is, for example, below $2 million, uh, the parties shall use the accelerated route. 
Um, certain institutions say if it's something, if the claim is below $250,000, they will use the accelerated route. So it all depends, but the yardstick is usually um, the money claimed. All right, there's a question that was posed. Uh, parties in their contract have chosen a three tribunal, uh, three bench, uh, arbitral tribunal. But then um, as the dispute has crystallized, they then agree to have accelerated procedures. And the institution that they choose to have the procedure on um, provides in the rules that only one arbitrator should determine the accelerated arbitration proced procedures. What would be the advice to the parties? Um, of course, there is freedom of contract. Um, the parties can agree at any time, regardless of what was written or regardless of what the rules provide. In the event that a dispute has arisen and um, really the amount claimed is not worth spending lots of money on paying a three-member tribunal, um, ordinarily uh, one member can do the accelerated route. And in certain, uh, in certain institutional clauses, in the event that the claim is below the threshold that I talked about, um, it automatically uh, nullifies the option of having a three-member tribunal. So, for example, if um, there is the default clause in the ICC which says that the tribunal shall be constituted by three members, in the event that the claim is below $2 million, then automatically you'll have a single arbitrator uh, who will utilize um, the, the accelerated route. Okay. Any other considerations from you in terms of inclusion um, by the participants while drafting arbitration uh, um, clauses? Yes. Um, if if um, the, the, the key issue that the participants need to know is whenever you, you, you're drafting the tired clause, every step of the way must have a timeline. It must have a timeline or it must have a provision that would lead one party to the other. Otherwise, it will be subject to abuse. For example, if you've said that there must be negotiation, you must put a timeline, say 15 days. If you put mediation, you must put a timeline, say 30 days. You must, you must also include a provision that in the event that one of the parties does not participate, uh, it does not preclude one party from going to the other level, uh, which will be arbitration as the final uh, dispute resolution mechanism. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, there have been mentioned, I think by both uh, Thomas and I'm right, Jerry mentioned the term pathological clauses at the beginning. Um, I don't know if you have come across what that means or whether you, you understand what it means and can then explain to the participants what is normally understood in arbitration cycles as pathological clauses in arbitration. Um, basically, I, I, I'm going to share a few examples of... Yeah. Uh, of, of what of what of what pathological clause is, but basically it's a clause which is defective. Uh, mm -hmm. Defective in a sense that uh, defective in a sense that a party can actually um, run away from arbitration on the basis that the arbitrator has no jurisdiction. So mm -hmm. one of the examples that I would give is, for example, the, this is one of the examples. Um, any dispute of whatever nature arising out of or in any way related to the arbitration or its construction or fulfillments may be referred to arbitration. Now, this clause used the word, the drafters used the word may be referred. So, so, so someone can actually take advantage of this to say that the parties did not agree 100% that arbitration would be the final dispute resolution mechanism. 
because of the use of maybe instead of shall be. So this will be pathological in a sense that um, the parties do not agree that arbitration will be the final dispute resolution mechanism. Another example is the clause below. The present contract is governed by the laws of Luxembourg. Possible disputes will in all cases be submitted to the Committee for Reconciliation of the International Chamber of Commerce. So possible disputes will in all cases. So possible disputes in a way, someone can interpret it to mean that it doesn't have finality, that all disputes. So it's always wise that in drafting, uh, the opening statements are very, very important. Any dispute regarding the contract, interpretation, performance, you must make sure that the arbitration clause is exhaustive and that the parties have agreed to resolve it through arbitration and not in any other way. So there are also certain sloppy multi-tiered clauses uh, for example, I've given two examples. Disputes shall be submitted to arbitration according to the rules of conciliation and arbitration of the ICC. Disputes which may be resolved by reconciliation shall be submitted first to conciliation. Uh, it's a mouthful. The use of may be is not appropriate in drafting arbitration clauses. Then the last one, the parties shall mediate so long as one party believes settlement through mediation is possible. Now, the use of the word, so long as one party believes, is open to abuse. One other party may say, I do not believe. So all the way, you realize that it will be a sloppy, multi-tiered clause. Over to you, Eunice. Great, thank you so much for that. I would like uh, additional comments on examples you've experienced, uh, Thomas, from your jurisdiction, from your practice on this kind of uh, defective clauses and what impact they can have in the general um, arbitration. Yeah, um, Eunice, I don't know if you have the slides that I have. Um, I, I could probably share a, a couple more examples. While you're doing that, um, you know, what I will say is that um, Pathological clauses are not always terminal cases. They, um, they, they don't always end in the parties not being able to go to arbitration and ending up in the courts instead. I think most arbitral tribunals and most national courts will look at the pathological clause and, tr and, and try to interpret it in a way to give effect to the intention of the parties. And often in these pathological clauses, it is clear, um, maybe not crystal clear, and maybe not, the, the words aren't clear, but it is clear that the parties intended to go to arbitration of some sort. And I think courts and tribunals will typically try to find a way around that, but that's not always the case. And I think in, in different jurisdictions, some, some jurisdictions um, are much more, um, uh, strict uh, uh, when they're interpreting the arbitration clauses uh, and it can create create problems. But even if you get past, um, even if you, uh, even if the pathological clause survives and the parties go off to arbitration, it does inevitably delay the process. Uh, it slows things down. It creates uh, difficulties. It adds to the cost of the arbitration. Again, if it's an ad hoc arbitration, you're probably going to find yourself uh, in courts to resolve some of the issues. So that's why I think it's so important to try to uh, draft these clauses succinctly and elegantly. Jerry, let's hear you also on this. I have anything to add to what some of David has said. Um, I, I think I did say that uh, the draft is not perfect because, yes, you need the wrong language, and that was uh, stated by David. Uh, then, we who are on the other end of the, on the British staff, for other reasons, we are the ones who are the um, that Thomas has clearly you know, underscored the, the, the problems that can arise. In, uh, in, in how to have to do with pathological, pathological clauses. Um, 
All right. So in terms of some, just some uh, thoughts, okay, on how to secure that effective clause, the clause that will ensure the rights of parties in the contract are well protected and their dispute results in an enforceable arbitration award. What are the thoughts of the panelists in terms of the key ways, the practical ways to secure that arbitration um, agreement before we look at the questions that members have sent across. We can start with David. Um, my advice is um, avoid reinventing the wheel. If there is an institutional clause by the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, use that one. If there is one for ICAMEC in Kampala and the dispute is really a domestic arbitration, use that one. Avoid reinventing the wheel. That's my advice. That's your only advice? Well, I have left uh, Thomas and Jerry to provide the rest. <laughs> okay, Thomas, you go next. Oh, well, first of all, let me say I completely agree with, with David. Don't, don't reinvent the wheel. There's no need to do that. Uh, NCIA and other arbitral institutions have very good model clauses that you can start with. The, the next point I would say, and I've said this before, is, is keep it simple, keep it succinct, keep it clear. Um, it, again, probably nine times out of 10, you don't need an arbitration clause that is more than say three or four sentences, maybe two paragraphs tops in exceptional circumstances. You know, I, I had an experience a few years ago, one of my colleagues who is a, a corporate lawyer came into my office and um, she said that um, one of our clients, which was a hotel management company, wanted us, wanted the firm to completely redo their standard hotel management agreement. And I think it was some, you know, the entire contract was 40 pages. And she said, you know, they want all the bells and whistles. They want the contract to be 60, 70, 80 pages. And, and Tom, I want you to work on the arbitration agreement and, you know, do whatever you think we need to do. It can be three, four, five pages long. And I said, well, Samantha, wait a minute. I don't think Look, I haven't even looked at this yet, but I can already tell you, you're not going to need a three or four or five page arbitration agreement. And I'll bet you won't even need a three or four or five paragraph arbitration agreement. I think we came up with something that was still relatively succinct, had a few extra bells and whistles. It was maybe two or three paragraphs. Um, again, all you really need at the end of the day is uh, you need uh, a, a referral to binding arbitration, number one. Uh, you need to address the number of arbitrators unless that's already in the institutional rules, number two. Number three, you need to identify the seat of the arbitration unless that's already in the institutional rules. Uh, I think it is a good idea to address the language issue. Um, I know Jerry talked about this earlier. Here in Dubai, this, this can be a real issue. Um, it's something we deal with quite a bit because and I don't want to get off track, but here in Dubai, uh, we have the federal arbitration law that applies to Dubai seated arbitrations, but we also have a, a free zone called the Dubai International Financial Center, the DIFC, and the DIFC has its own arbitration law. So if your seat of arbitration is the DIFC, you're subject to the DIFC arbitration law. If your seat is Dubai, you're subject to the federal arbitration law, and that can create some issues in terms of language because if you have an ad hoc arbitration in Dubai, the default language under the law is Arabic. If you have, uh, let's say a DIAC, a Dubai International Arbitration Center arbitration in Dubai, the default language under the DIAC rules is the language of the contract in which the arbitration agreement is contained. So that could be English, it could be Arabic, it could be something else. If you're in the DIFC, the default language is English. So you, you need to be careful. And Dubai is a little bit unique in this regard because we have these different laws, but I think the language uh, uh, is important. Um, um, identify in the arbitration clause institution or ad hoc um, and how your arbitrators are going to, 
to, to be appointed. Again, there's only really five or six core elements. If you're an institutional arbitration, a lot of that will be dealt with, but keep it simple and keep it succinct. Great, thank you so much. I would really like right now without uh, further ado, to look at some of the questions that have come through by the participants. Okay, and sorry. Sorry. The final question. I also had a little to say, if you don't mind. All right. Yes. 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 Jerry, please, please. Uh, and Jerry, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. By the way, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you hear me now? It's still uh, faint. Still faint. You're a little faint. I think it must have something to do with my microphone. Okay. It's How better. That? It's better. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, maybe just need to sit quite close. Yeah, I, I just what Thomas has said underscores um, why uh, you as the drafter have to be discerning um, and not just to assume um, that you know there's one one clause fits all. Uh, you can see this is one country called, uh, I mean, one place called Dubai, but it has two, two different jurisdictions within the country. And um, you need to be careful. So I, I think the point is don't assume. When you're drafting, if you have to draft, and I have to I support what uh, David and Thomas have said, you are not a jack of all things. You know what it means if you are a jack of all trades, you are master of none. When it comes to drafting, drafting arbitration clauses, please speak out of this. Yes, there's the NCIA. Yes, there's the Charter. And I'm sure you also know people personally who you can talk to, who are masters, uh, master drafters in the particular area in terms of drafting arbitration clauses. So, not everyone has this, by the way, because I know this might be one of the deterrents. Like for me, I'm happy to share the uh, arbitration clauses that I have made you so. Keeping them again, as, uh, as Thomas has said, clear, simple, and succinct. Also, my first top cup and seat also applies here, by the way. So, um, go to the market when it comes to adjusting adjust, an agreement. There are so many out there, and don't go to the internet, by the way. Uh, go to the market. Thank you very much, Jerry. Jerry has given us very good advice. Um, don't make it too long. You can open it up to all manner of challenge. Make it short and decent. I think that's what I hear Jerry to say. And do not reinvent the wheel. There are established institutions that have model arbitration clauses, which you can consider. That's what uh, some of the advice we've had today. So allow me to quickly go through some of the questions that have come through. And I'll start with you, David. Um, and there's a question from Dina, which is that in construction contracts, is it necessary for the arbitration clause to grant powers to the arbitrators to open up decisions already settled by the adjudication board created by the contract. An example is where an initial dispute has been settled by a dispute adjudication board in a FIDI contract. Yet another party disputed the dispute adjudication board decision. Is it? I don't know if the question is clear. Yep. Yes, the question is clear. Um, it's good that uh, the, the participant has referred to the 3D contract. Uh, the 3D contract is one of those that has the multi-tiered clause, um, basically which provides that in case there's a dispute, um, the engineer who this time round is a project manager uh, usually listens to the parties and makes a determination. And um, if either party is dissatisfied with that determination um, within a period of 28 days, uh, 
they refer the dispute to the dispute adjudication board. Uh, sometimes it's constituted of three people or one adjudicator. Uh, that same clause provides that in the event that you're not dissatisfied with the decision of the dispute adjudication board, um, the dispute shall be referred uh, to arbitration. Um, the fee contract contracts usually refer to ICC. Um, and the, the import of that provision is that the decision of the dispute adjudication board is not final. The contract says that it is binding in a sense that as soon as the dispute adjudication board renders its decision, uh, the parties must respect it. Um, but it is not final in a sense that either party can refer it to arbitration. Now, it is only the arbitration clause regarding finality that provides that once the arbitrator has rendered their decision, it's now final and binding. So yes, an arbitrator has jurisdiction uh, to tear apart the dispute adjudication's findings. Okay, thank you so much. Allow me panelists to just thank all our participants coming from all over the world. I see we have people from Ethiopia, we have Abu Dhabi, we have Singapore, you have Morocco listeners. We have um, Addis Ababa, we have Uganda, we have friends from um, Nigeria listening in. Thank you so much for being here. We acknowledge you and we thank you for participating. Um, another question, Jerry, is the seat the same as place of arbitration? The answer is yes. Thank you. Another question is, if there is a clause that states that arbitration shall be in Nairobi, is this referring to the seat or the venue? Thomas. This is a good question. And, and this is where you can start to get into a little bit of trouble if there's not clarity in the agreement. I would interpret this to mean that the seat is Nairobi, but not everybody would. Um, I would interpret, you know, if there was a reference to a particular jurisdiction or country, I think most arbitrators, I think most courts would say that the parties intended that to be a reference to the seat. Um, but it's not always clear. I think we're, when you start to get into trouble is, you know, if they say that the, the hearing shall be held in Nairobi or the venue shall be held in Nairobi, query whether that's clear enough to turn that into the seat. I, I think often it will be, but I think this drives home why when you're drafting the agreement, you should say the legal seat or place of arbitration shall be Nairobi or whatever. Thank you so much. Jerry, I have a question which I would like you to address. The question is that the judiciary is slow. Lots of time is wasted in government matters. Which is the best country nearest to Kenya for arbitration? Nearest to Kenya for arbitration. Clearly, they need to hear you on this. Um, of course, uh, I would say always Nairobi, but uh, if you need to go somewhere else, go to Kenya. But, yeah, but I also tend to think that they need to understand in terms of going to arbitration, um, it's the contract. So they need to specify in their contract. So in the contract, you would have to indicate that the seat will be valid, which means that it is Rwanda. Uh, I think you, if you must move away from, from Kenya. And I, I, I'm not sure that I, I, I really like that. I mean, the, I know it's here. Kenyan judiciary is slow, lots of time we said in government matters. But let me ask you also, having read that, who is wasting the time? Is it the arbitrator? Is it the, the, the advocate? What's going on? Uh, because when you ask matters, uh, oh, you can't hear me. I can see somebody saying, I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit unclear. 
Can you hear me now? Is that better? It's better. Sorry, I'm going to smash my face against the desk. <laughs> All right. So that yeah. you can hear me properly. And um, the question one needs to ask themselves is what is the source of the time wasted before you seek to move your arbitration elsewhere? Is it the advocate? Is it the judges themselves? Um, what can be changed? Um, if you do need to move, yes, uh, I would say go to Kigali. Um, and I think you may, you may know better whether there are court system move faster than ours. Uh, but I have to say that my um, experience over the last 20 so on and so forth years is that we are moving faster today than we did many years ago. Uh, it was terrible before. Yeah. Uh, before 2000, nothing was moved. Um, and and it's, it's really much better. I think there still is a lot of sensitization that needs to be done with advocates who don't bring themselves to arbitration uh, so as to learn what is required of them and also why it is, the, it is the preferred mode or form of this resolution as against going to court. Um, okay. still a lot to learn. Yeah, and I think looking at the question, he's, it's clear that they have not considered arbitration. So they probably need to consider arbitration in those disputes, even if they're government disputes. They can consider arbitration clause um, and they can, because this is an NCIA um, session, they can look at the, the rules which are online and see whether the arbitration clause can save you trouble in court and time. You can simply adopt that clause and instead of court, you then move your dispute to arbitration. I'll go to another question. Um, how do you break an impasse when negotiating, let me just. Uh, so the question is from Eva Odongo. What tips do you have to break an impasse when negotiating the clause between international part partners on the issue of seat jurisdiction and venue? See, um, the question that arises probably is um, due to the fact that sometimes you have parties who, because of whatever reason, maybe egos, they feel that their jurisdiction would are better than other jurisdiction. What would be the advice to break an impasse between negotiating parties? Tom, some tips to the questioner? Yeah, I think this is a very good question. I think my, my, my first answer is be creative, right? Because when you're negotiating an arbitration agreement or a dispute resolution clause, there are different points where you can engage in give and take, right? You can negotiate which arbitral institution is going to administer the dispute. You can negotiate the seat of the arbitration. You can negotiate the governing law of the arbitration. And you know, one thing I see a lot is, is sort of the mindset that if you're going to have a Nairobi seat, you have to use the NCIA. And if you're going to have a London seat, you have to use the LCIA. And if you're going to have a Singapore seat, you have to use SIAC. And I think it's important to bear in mind that's not the case. You could easily have a Dubai seated arbitration that's administered by the NCIA. And I think that's one way that you can start to be a little bit creative and, and try to break these impasses, say, well, look, we'll, we'll, use, we'll use the arbitral institution in your hometown to administer it, but I want the seat in, in my hometown. Or, you know, let's, let's try a, a neutral venue altogether. Uh, and, and, and instead of uh, using uh, NCIA, Lawrence won't like me saying this, but instead of using NCIA, let's use KIAC in Kigali or use the Mauritius Center. Um, try to negotiate it that way. And then also bear in mind um, uh, the governing law as well. That, there, that's another area of give and take. Um, so I think there are ways around this. It's not always easy. And it, it, you know, it, it, you're gonna have to engage in good old fashioned negotiating uh, techniques and it would depend on the circumstances of the case. But I think in the context of 
arbitration specifically, there are, are ways to do it. I think your question also answers the other question by the same, Eva Odonga, Odongo, which is what should you consider in determining the jurisdiction or system or center for arbitration in an arbitration clause? Unless there's anything you want to add to that, I think your answer has captured. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. All right. Um, we also have a question from, I think, Adiz Ababa from Rahel. Can you combine arbitration and court intervention with an appeal, right, following an arbitration award? I, I, I don't know whether this question is with respect to the arbitration contract, so that she's asking whether you can have a right to appeal following an arbitral award. David, do you want to say something about this? Yes. Um, you can actually agree that um, the arbitral award can be challenged by any of the parties on questions of law by way of appeal. In Uganda, under our Arbitration and Conciliation Act, we have a provision under Section 38 where the parties can agree from the onset that the decision of the, of the arbitral tribunal uh, can be challenged on a point of law only uh, on appeal. So it is possible uh, if you include it uh, in the agreement. But to put it in context, uh, in the absence of agreement, an arbitral award is not appealable. You can only apply to set it aside. Okay. Right, there's another question here. I hope uh, we can hear you clearly, Jerry. If parties have chosen to apply to the NCIA to pick an arbitration tribunal or an arbitrator, does it follow that they have to use the NCIA rules? I would not say so, unless of course it is in the, uh, the contract itself in that arbitration agreement. Um, um, you can decide um, whether or not to apply those NCIA rules within your application. Um, and also, it is not something that the party has considered. The arbitrator, him or herself, will also make a, a proposal to you as to which rules should be applicable. All right. Uh, almost finally. Uh, Thomas, this goes to you. An arbitration clause that simply states the arbitration shall be in Kenya. Does it automatically mean it will be the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration handling this arbitration? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, to me, when I hear that clause, an arbitration in Kenya, what that says to me is the parties have agreed to ad hoc arbitration seated in Kenya. And uh, in the absence of any further agreement, um, the uh, NCIA rules would not apply and the NCIA would not uh, administer it. Okay. So it doesn't, it doesn't follow that. Yeah. yeah, you would need an, a specific reference, an express reference to uh, to the NCIA or any other arbitral institution. So, perhaps the final question from Khalid Eslihi. <laughs> I hope I meant like, I pronounced that appropriately. Is there a possibility to have a conflict between the procedural law? and the procedural rules of the chosen arbitration institution. David, maybe can I repeat? Conflict between procedural law and procedural rules of the institution. Yes, um, it's possible. That's why in drafting you have to be very careful. So, um, for example, you may um, adopt um, the procedural rules, uh, for example, of uh, the NCIA, which uh, uh, will be applied by the parties. Um, and if 
the seat, which is the procedural law is um, in Dubai, for example, you may find that uh, certain things are acceptable there, yet certain things are not acceptable. So I think it's important that in drafting, you make sure that you avoid the conflict uh, between these two. All right. Jerry? You have designated as a, a in, in your arbitration uh, clause an institution that does not exist in, in actual reality. I've, had, I've seen one that says uh, the institution will be, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the chairman of the Chartered Institute of, uh, of Arbitrators Court or Commission or something like that. What would be the advice? That's a pathological default appointer because here you have a thing to be that. And this is what I'll say. We need the people talking about the issue problem. Uh, they had not checked before this on the correct name of the institute before they inserted it in the document. So, what happens if we leave you without either a default appointer or a main appointer? Where does that take you? You fall back on the act. Uh, the procedural law of the seat or the seat. So what does it say? Does it say go back to you have to the court is the one that appoints, you go to court and have it appointed. If you yourself as the party cannot agree. If you can um, have consensus on the appointment of that uh, arbitrator, uh, well and good, but as I have said from the outset, once the dispute arises. There is little hope of uh, having the party agree. So fall back on the procedural law. I think that's what I would like to find. All right. Uh, would like to hear concluding remarks. I just want to inform the participants, if there are any other questions that, may, that may, may be coming through, I wish to encourage you to send an email to the NCAA. You can uh, also find them. They have their Twitter handle, they have, I mean, social media handles. But we um, wish to advise that you may send through quest other questions that may be coming through, and they will be answered to the NCIS email, which I will share. But for now, can we have some concluding remarks from each of the panelists? I could start with Thomas. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Eunice, and thank you to my fellow panelists and the attendees, and thank you for the very good questions. I think we, we, we got to grapple with a lot of very insightful uh, uh, questions. I, I think my concluding remarks would be just to sum up, um, don't treat arbitration clauses as midnight clauses uh, when you're negotiating them. Think about the impl implications early on in the process. Um, think about the arbitration agreement, the consequences thereof as part of the overall negotiations of the commercial transaction. Uh, when you do draft a clause, keep it short and succinct, uh, address the key elements and try to create as much certainty as you can uh, if and when a dispute arises. Thank you. Uh, next we can hear from Jerry. I echo what uh, Thomas has said, very important, and also please do not try to be, as I said, I think in the course of this, a jack of all trades. If this is just not your forte, please look for the professional or look to a, 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 um, an institute, an institution such as the or Kenya branch, or another professional. Jerry, we can, we can barely hear you. Okay, and, and now? It's better. Sorry better? about that. Yes. No, no yes. problem. I'm saying, um, as I had, I, I, I echo what Thomas has said, and also don't try to be a jack of all trades. I think that's what I've, I've been saying. Um, please refer to the professionals when it comes to drafting uh, uh, you know, arbitration clauses, because then you have your pathological ones. 
Um, look to the professionals, look to the institutions to give you a, 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 what Thomas has been referring to as a, as a, what did you say, clear, simple, and succinct clause. Uh, thought, stuff, and speak, and uh, so that you do not create problems for people down the line. Um, yes, Jerry, since we might have a challenge on Eunice's end, <clears throat> uh, let, me, let me have the privilege then to invite Thomas to make his uh, concluding remarks. Thomas? I, I, I think I've done so. I think it's uh, David's turn. Oh, David, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, my concluding remarks is, first of all, I wish to thank um, NCIA for organizing uh, this webinar. Uh, thank you very much. And to all my fellow panelists, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Uh, my last concluding remarks are that uh, you may make a mistake in the arbitration clause, uh, maybe with the rules or with the tribunal, but you should never fail to make it very clear that arbitration is the final dispute resolution mechanism. That should always be very, very clear. The rest of the mistakes, the court can help you, but you cannot say that we shall go to arbitration or either party can go to court. It means you never agreed arbitration in the first place. So that's my last remark. Okay, <clears throat> I'm sure the participants will agree with me. Uh, this has been an insightful, informative session. As um, Eunice had promised initially, this would be an eminent panel and they have proven to be exactly that. Um, as I wind up, I thank you uh, for having joined us from the various jurisdictions that you are drawn from. As NCIA, our commitment is to continue conversation that helps uh, make arbitration not only efficient, but effective. And today's focus was on effectiveness, right from the art of drawing the arbitration clause. To conclude, um, I remember the words of uh, Judge Barrett um, in, in, in reminding us one of the uh, values, the, the valuable assets that an, an advocate has. He makes the comment that the, the greatest weapon for a lawyer is clarity. And its whetstone is succinctness. And I've heard those words repeated today. Uh, for those of you who have an African background, you know, each um, hut, each, each village had a stone where the weapon was sharpened. Now for the lawyer, clarity is that weapon and the stone is a symptom. And that couldn't be more applicable than in the arbitration clause um, aspect. So thank you very much for joining us. We don't take it for granted that you spared your day, night, afternoon in this new normal uh, to join this uh, wonderful discussion. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, Tunjeri Karyuki, we always appreciate having you with us. Uh, David, uh, thank you for joining uh, the family of NCIA in this webinars. Uh, we look forward to having you in another session. And to Thomas, uh, we look forward to having you now in Nairobi, not Mombasa. Uh, thank you for making time for us today. Uh, Eunice is back. Yes. Is back. She is back now. That's what happens with the prison closes. Very flexible and creative. Eunice, over to you. Oh, I am very sorry about that. Um, what to do, what to say sometimes. I mean, that's, that's, you know, what to do. Now, I just wanted to mention one thing because I, I don't know what has transpired, but there was a question asked about charges for NCIA and uh, charges for tribunals and arbitrators. Um, they can find this in the arbitration rules. 
uh, by the NCIA, which are available online. And the contacts for the NCIA will be shared. I think we had the, e the email for the NCIA will be shared in case of further questions. Uh, I don't know, Jerry had finished speaking, David. So I think that's it. We just want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you, NCIA, for availing this opportunity to discuss a very pertinent issue in arbitration. And um, I want to wish everyone well and hope to participate again in future um, webinars or physical meetings. Yes. Thank yeah, you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for being an able moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So see you and have a good day or evening or afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Yunis and everybody. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Pleasure being on a panel, same panel as you, Thomas and David. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Yes, we can all exit, I guess, at our own pleasure.